Hey Joe Chemist, welcome back for another video here on Joe Chem. In this video, we're gonna talk about some amide chemistry, more specifically a reaction called the Hoffman rearrangement. It's not that bad, we're gonna step through the mechanism, we'll do an example problem, that's what we're pretty much gonna do in the video, and I think you'll find that it's very straightforward and luckily, pretty simple. So if you just take a quick look over here, in this reaction, what we need is uh, an amide, but more, it can't just be any amide. It has to be a primary amide, uh, right? That's why there's a little pink star next to it. A primary amide, which will has, by definition has to be terminal, has to be on the end of the structure. Uh, and also, we need a basic environment. So the conditions we're dealing with here, obviously we need a basic environment. That's why we see just sodium hydroxide. And obviously if we have hydroxide, we're aqueous, so there's water available to us. But we need some type of... Uh, uh, you know, Br2, Cl2, some type of uh, diatomic halide, right? Or just diatomic halogen, rather. Okay, so what the reaction ends up doing, you might just be thinking, oh, we're just getting rid of the carbonyl. Look a little bit more carefully. We're not just getting rid of the carbonyl. It's almost as if like we're wiping away not just the carbonyl oxygen, but the carbon in that carbonyl itself. What I forgot to write here is we're also going to produce carbon dioxide, okay? So, obviously, we want to know how to get, you know, step through this and how it works. Wait no further. Here we go. So, to start this mechanism, the very first thing that's going to happen is we need to play the deprotonation game a little bit. So, we're going to introduce our sodium hydroxide here. Of course, I'm just going to draw OH minus. Obviously, that sodium spectator ion is hanging around. We're not going to worry about that. So, in the very first step, we're going to just deprotonate the nitrogen in the amide. And then, since we do have Cl2 nearby, the very now, the now very negative nitrogen is going to get, go ahead and attack it and uh, just snatch up a Cl. And once again, we're gonna go back to the deprotonation game because we have one more hydrogen left. So bring in yet another sodium hydroxide. Snatch up the last proton. I'm going to bring this down over here. Whoop. Okay, so here's where things get interesting. So we've deprotonated all we can deprotonate and our nitrogen has a negative charge. This is a pretty wacky part of the mechanism. The, ha the Cl, or halide, is just going to leave all by itself. It's a good leaving group, no worries about that. But strangely enough, right, we have a nitrogen with a negative charge. We know those types of species are very basic. So weirdly enough, by that halogen leaving, yes, nitrogen only has three bonds, it does not have a full octet, right? We only have two, four, six electrons. However, we're neutral, right? Because nitrogen likes to have a formal charge of five. That's what it comes in with. One, two, three, four, five. So we've seen, you may have seen these types of uh, species before with carbon. If you have ever run into a Simmons-Smith reaction, those were carbenes. Well, weirdly enough, this is a nitrine. Okay. So the fact that nitrogen does not have a full octet is what's going to allow this rearrangement to occur. Up to this point, all we did was deprotonate, attack a halogen, deprotonate, halogen leaves. Here's the wacky part of the mechanism. Right here, this carbon to carbon bond, the one between the alpha carbon and the carbonyl carbon, this is going to just move. It's basically going to say, peace out carbonyl carbon, I want to hang out with nitrogen instead. So when that happens, these electrons from nitrogen also swing down. And you might be thinking, does that break the octet rule? And no, it does not because nitrogen can accept a bond right here. That's fine. And even though this bond's swinging down, this bond's leaving. So this carbon doesn't see a net gain or loss of a bond. So what does that look like when we draw it out? So this two carbons right here, this little ethyl piece no longer exists there. So what I'm going to do from now on I'm going to draw this oxygen and this, I'm going to asterisk this carbon just to make it very, very, very clear where we're at. 
We have a double bond then to nitrogen. That nitrogen has one lone pair left over. And now we have two bonds coming off like this. Okay, so this is what we got. I know I kind of changed the orientation of how it's looking, but I promise you to finish this mechanism out, it will, uh, it's, it's a good view, promise. Okay, so weirdly enough, in that rearrangement, nitrogen now has one, two, three, four, or one, one, two, three, four bonds. It has a full octet now. The rearrangement did, to, you know, get rid of the nitrine. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce water to the mix. And what happens here is the oxygen is interested in the very positive, partial positive carbon, right? Because we're bonded to both oxygen and nitrogen. This carbon right here is super partial positive. Oxygen in the water is negative. We see that match made in heaven. So what's going to happen is the oxygen is going to attack right here. And the errors are a little strange, but to save a bunch of steps, what's gonna happen is this nitrogen is going to grab this H and get protonated. So, and then these electrons would uh, swing onto oxygen. So it's a weird flow, but basically we're going to attack the carbon right here. And to save us the arrows of having these kick up, kick back down, and then having these get protonated, you can just draw this step right here. So what that looks like, oxygen, double bond to carbon. Now we have an OH. Now we have a single bond to nitrogen. We still have the lone pair. Now we have an H. And now we have the rest of the carbon chain, which we did not touch. Okay, so we haven't produced carbon dioxide. We haven't gotten rid of, uh, you know, we see CO2 right here though. We basically be perfectly set ourselves up for a decarboxylation step. So what that's going to look like, because we need to have an NH2, how this will go is, and I'm gonna redraw this lone pair right here, actually right here. The nitrogen, is going to reach out and grab this hydrogen. And I'm actually going to draw this a little differently so you can actually see the bond. Then this, we're just grabbing H+, just a proton. These two electrons here are going to swing down and form a C double O bond, basically forming carbon dioxide. And because we need the carbon dioxide to get booted off, now these electrons go back onto nitrogen. So nitrogen doesn't lose any electrons and we just produced the CO2 gas. And you can definitely see we've cleaved a bond right here. So now we have that amine as well. And we see it has two carbons like we thought up here. So we started with three, we ended with two, just because when you do a Hoffman rearrangement, you're basically just wiping that away and smushing together. All right. So the mechanism, not that bad. All we had to do was deprotonate, attack, add a halogen, deprotonate, hit the weird part, right? We had the halogen leave, we did the rearrangement, we had a protonation attack kind of step, a decarboxylation step, and our final product. Okay, gang, so I really think you'd probably see this on a complete the reaction section of a test. If you get the mechanism, it's not that bad. We know it. But let me just erase this. We'll do one problem. We'll call it a video. Okay, gang, so let's crush this example and call it a video. All right, so if we are given this reaction and we're told to predict the product, I think the first thing we wanna think about uh, before immediately saying this is a Hoffman elimination, or sorry, Hoffman rearrangement, different thing. Hoffman rearrangement is, does it fit the criteria for a Hoffman rearrangement? And we know that means we need a primary amide as well as basic conditions or a basic environment. And I think hopefully I, by the time I'm finishing write, writing that, you can see, look, yep, primary amine, or sorry, amide, primary amide, right? Only one bond to carbon, it's terminal. And we do have basic conditions because we have sodium hydroxide. And we also see that we have the Cl2, which, you know, this could have been Br2, whatever. We just needed that, okay? So we can do the mechanism. We just prove that to ourselves. But remember, the way the Hoffman elimination is going to work is we're basically going to wipe this away and then smush together. So I'm assuming, uh, I'm assuming that we're not going to maintain stereochemistry here. 
let's let's draw the product. So we're not touching the benzene ring, and I know I'm going to have these two carbons up here, and now an NH2. And you know what? Mm, try to think about this in the mechanism. Yeah, you know what? I think we're probably going to retain stereochemistry, so I would just keep that as is because this was a stereocenter at first. We had this going on, right? One, two, three, four different things, and nothing changes on that front either. Four different things. So easy, complete the reaction question. It's basically we have done things in the past where we just kind of reduce a carbonyl away and we just have it, you know, relieve the original carbonyl carbon. This is a situation where we basically just wipe it away. Okay, gang, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for doing some hoffman arrangements with me. And uh, I'll see you guys, I'll see you all in the next video.